lunch will be fantastic. I guarantee it. It is every year. Okay. I think that's it in terms of announcements that I have. Today, we have a real honor to have Dr. Andre Stevens here. Dr. Stevens is the 14th president of Fresno Pacific University. Some of you know that Fresno Pacific University is Tabor's sister school. There are two Mennonite Brethren colleges in the United States, Tabor College and Fresno Pacific University in Fresno, California. Dr. Stevens just became president there last year, so he's in his sophomore year, and I am in my third year, so my junior year, just a year ahead of him, and so he and I have had wonderful conversations this weekend and over the last year, almost year and a half. He became a fast friend, Andre and his wife, Beth, and I love his heart for students, and he has a very soft heart for God and his work, and so I look forward to what he has to say today. A little bit of background, so Dr. Stevens has, was at Biola University in many different administrative positions and leadership positions for 31 years. He was an associate vice president in enrollment management, and most recently, he was the vice president of student development at Biola University. He, was, he, got, he received his bachelor's degree at Biola, and so he spent a lot of years in Los Angeles and at Biola. Um, if I remember correctly, he ran track as, as, a, a, uh, as a youngster, and he got his master's degree from California State University Fullerton. I taught at a California State University in Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, so I have a connection there. And then he did his PhD at Claremont Graduate School in Higher Education Administration. Dr. Stevens has, uh, is married, his wife's name is Beth, and he has three amazing children who are all just a step ahead of you in terms of beginning their careers and in graduate school, and they're doing amazing things, and it's wonderful to hear about them. I am so pleased to have Dr. Stevens here. Would you please join me with a huge Tabor welcome for Andre Stevens. Thank you, Dr. Jansen. And I uh, bring you greetings from Fresno, California. The faculty, the students, and the staff there know that I'm here and they are praying for you and praying for me as I bring uh, God's word this morning to you. We are your baby sister institution. Tabor was founded in 1908, Fresno Pacific in 1944. Uh, so we're your little sister. Um, but we're gr grateful to, to be here and be in partnership with you. And if you hear one thing from me today, I want you to know that God loves you. My life was changed sitting in a chapel 35 years ago as you are today. And it was changed because the love of God was proclaimed from a uh, space like this. I'm going to give a little background of myself, a little uh, uh, of my story, and then I'm going to center us on, on Numbers 13. That's the, the chapter uh, of the book of Numbers that we will be in this, this morning. But first, I do want to show this first slide. And just again to Dr. Jansen's, we met last year in northern San Diego County at a new President's Institute. And as Dr. Jansen said, we became fast friends, and First Lady Karen has been a great friend to Beth uh, as well. This is, uh, uh, being a college president is one of the hardest jobs that you can do outside of, uh, I think, some of the things that first responders do. Um, it's like, who would want to do this? It is crazy busy. And so uh, we're so grateful for President Jansen and Karen and their love for us and their love for you. They're an example to us. And so uh, sophomores, we look up to our juniors, and I certainly look up to President Jansen. I think the next slide shows um, us at my inauguration this earlier this year. We uh, made it, and I don't have my bling yet. Uh, President Jansen has his. I, I um yeah, these, the, these are special times that as colleagues you're to, together in the work that we do. And I, I do want to say one, one thing, and I share this at Fresno Pacific often as I speak to faculty, staff, and students. These robes that you see us wearing, um, they are actually descended from the monastic tradition of education, which higher ed, which you're sitting in, is actually... Um, is actually a direct descendant of. And those robes are like priestly robes. And so uh, we believe that's a sacred duty, a sacred call um, in our work with you as, as students. 
And so when, when we put on those robes, they're symbolic of Jesus, our high priest, right? And it represents not only a, the authority of the priest, but humility, authority and humility. That humility is found in service. And Jesus himself, many, many of you know that he got on his knees and wa- washed the disciples' feet. And so the work that we do is a sacred call for and with you. And it's a service to you. We want to see you thrive. We want to see you um, receive the love of Jesus Christ. And so next slide. This is uh, a picture of Beth and I. We've been married. We, we got married in the late 1900s. And um, thank you. Thank you for laughing. I try to put a few jokes in there. The late 1900s, she and I met. We were college sweethearts. Uh, we were good friends. She uh, I started to crush on her, and then she said, no, I like you like a brother. And I'm just like, what? That's like the worst thing that you're, someone could say. But uh, 32 plus years later, we are uh, going strong. And um, this is a picture of us in Montana. I've always wanted to go to Montana. I don't know why anyone from Montana, but it was a beautiful time. Uh, we were just right outside Glacier Park in, in that picture. And I think the next slide shows, um, this is my family. So uh, we ha- our oldest, there's Jason, he's 27. Our middle son is 24 up in front. And then you see Beth and Tori, Victoria. Um, and then s- sneaking her head out in the back is Zaxi, our rescue dog. And so she, this is in Santa Barbara earlier this summer. So I just want you to know my family, super important to me. And uh, again, the work uh, that we do. So let's see, what does the next slide show? Um, so yeah, if you're not familiar, I am, uh, f- f- my family of origin is from Central America, actually from Panama, uh, but I was born in New York, grew up in Southern California, uh, went to Biola as President Janchen shared, and California is a big state, it's actually the most populous state with nearly 40 million people. If you're not familiar with it, you can see here on the, so the southern part of California is Los Angeles, and then you move to the center, there's Fresno. Right, and Fresno is si- very similar actually to the Midwest, a lot of agriculture, millions of acres, millions of acres of, of farms and fields. In fact, 60% of the nation's fruits, vegetables, and nuts come from the Central Valley of California. And I think the next slide shows, um, it's, you see those trees, you see the Golden Gate Bridge in the north, Hollywood in the south, and those trees there represent, so interesting, so two of the nation's national parks, like just iconic parks, Yosemite and Sequoia are just, um, you know, a short drive away from Central California. I had not been to uh, Yosemite in almost 20 years. And so a year ago, um, I took my cabinet team to a retreat in Oakhurst, which is right outside, maybe a half an hour outside the gates of Yosemite. And then it takes another hour to get to the valley floor. One of our cabinet members at the time is a big photographer, has the, all this camera and equipment. And he said, Andre, let's, let's um, since we're this close, let's go up to Yosemite. And I want to take some night pictures because he's really, again, takes pictures of all seasons of Yosemite. And so against my, a little bit of my, I was so tired, but he said, let's do it. So we, we rolled up to Yosemite about 11 o'clock at night. And the, this is one of the pictures he took. And maybe next slide. This is... Um, I think this is Half Dome, or uh, yeah, that's a picture of uh, Half Dome there. This is 11 at night. It's just moon moonlit, and it's just it's it's actually just really dark. But his camera and all the things that go, and those of you who are in the photography is able to capture this. And the next slide shows uh, El Capitan as well. And and you guys know, or some of you know, the rock climbing and people doing like uh, like free solo and all that. It's just amazing. So we're standing there at night. And, um, and it's just, uh, again, it's actually super dark around us. And then uh, his camera is able to capture these stunning views of El Capitan and Half Dome, which are just iconic, as you know, from Ansel Adams and all this stuff. And so I turned to m- him and I said, hey, um, I said, John, can I take a picture with my iPhone? And he's just like, well, you know, some of the new iPhones, you, you know, they have whatever in them so you can take pictures at night because, again, it's, it's really black. So I, so I took a picture, and next slide, this is a picture of, of uh, I'm with my iPhone. So uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't work, right? You need the special, you need the special uh, equipment to take pictures at 11 o'clock at night. Um, thank you again for laughing. I appreciate that. Um, so, and, but this is a thing. When you are standing in a place like that, you see how big God is. And again, you discuss, either you deepen your relationship with him or you discover 
how big he is in, in the world. And um, there's, two, there's two scriptures for me, and before we get into the main text today, that I just want to let you know where, where I'm coming from. Like I told you, I'm from Panama, family of origin, born in New York, uh, raised in Southern California. But I want you to know where I'm coming from spiritually as well. I, I would say I, I am a Christian, and I just want you to know that. Like I believe that God has created us and that he loves us, and he has a plan. Uh, for our lives. And so before I get into the, to the, the main text for this morning, I want you to know where I'm coming from, not only geographically, but spiritually. And the last couple of years for me, there was a couple verses that God just impressed on my heart, and I want to share them with you. One is from Acts 17. And this is what it says. Paul is speaking in Acts 17. And the, I, 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 wanna, I highlighted one particular part of this verse, and it says that that um, God made from one person, he made everyone. From one person, he made everyone. And so we're brothers and sisters. We are brothers and sisters. So I come and I greet you, uh, and as I see you, we are, we, are brothers and, we are brothers and sisters. From one person, God made everyone. And he says that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their t appointed times in history and the boundaries of their land. So one version says that he, uh, he determined, he determined, when they should live, and where they should live, essentially. So we're not time travelers from the past. We're not time travelers from the future. But God has appointed our times for now. And I don't know about you, again, the last few years, especially in, in, the, in the COVID pandemic issues, people just wanted to escape. They wanted to go back. They wanted to go someplace other than where they were. But I, I believe that God has appointed our times for now. You are not here uh, by accident. You are here because God has appointed our time for now. And we're brothers and sisters. Okay? And then the other verse is found in First Peter. And that verse says the end of all things is near. And certainly in COVID, again, this came to me in the first part of COVID. Um, and it felt that way. I mean, I was in Los Angeles at the time. And uh, I remember going to, to um, Costco, actually, in Whittier, California, and driving there, and there's a line that looked like a mile long uh, for toilet paper. And I'm just like, yeah, the end, the end seems there. There's one point where I was driving on the freeway. I went to get, I, I had to go pick something up from our church, and I'm on the 605 freeway, and there's no cars in front of me, no cars behind me, no cars on the side of me, in the middle of the day in L.A., Never happens, never happens if you've ever driven uh, the freeways in L.A. So it did feel like the end of uh, the all things is near. And this is what uh, the word says. Therefore, be alert, be alert and sober minded. Why? So that you can pray. And for those of us who believe that there is a God, uh, that we in the midst of all that's going on, our first duty is to pray. And then and then this is what he says. Above all, above all, love each other deeply. Because love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers a multitude of sins. And again, if you remember that time as you were going through it, um, Zoom classes and all that stuff, it's like, how do we love people? Because things are so divisive and polarized. And um, here we are, this call to pray, to be alert and sober-minded, and to love deeply. This is the greatest commandment, right? The, the, the um, Jews had many commandments, and they asked Jesus, like, what's the greatest? He said, oh, I'll, g I'll give you one. Love, it's called a double love. Love God and love others. Love God and love others. It's vertical, horizontal. That's our call. And so that's what I'm coming today to encourage you. <laughs> love God and love others. My life was changed sitting in a chapel. Again, I told you this. This is like 35 years ago. And it was changed because I, I had grown up, and, and, and words that I would use now to, to describe my home life is I had a dad who was super angry. He was an angry person. Again, words that I would d use to describe him now. And that anger came out in a lot of different forms. Uh, but I'm going to spare you the details. But the, the, the gist of it is that I was afraid of my dad. I was afraid of my dad. So, so as I grew up, I just wanted to, I was compliant uh, because I didn't want to get hit by my dad. And that was how I viewed God. I viewed God that he had got the world started and that he was just there to punish you anytime you did something wrong. That was my view of God. I believed that he existed, but he was mean, he was angry, and he just wanted to punish me anytime I did something wrong. So as I grew up, 
I got to high school, and, and like many of you know, you, as, you, as you're adulting or starting the uh, end of high school, you start asking these like existential questions. Who am I? Why am I here? What am I created for? And in high school, uh, President Jansen mentioned I ran track, but I actually played basketball in high school. Actually, I didn't play. I was on the team. I, just, <laughs> I actually just sat on the bench <laughs> most of the time. I learned the cheers, though. It was really uh, good. But, uh, but in, in high school, uh, between my junior and senior year, years, we went to Westmont College up in Santa Barbara for a summer basketball camp. And I loved it. I felt like we're by the beach, can hang out, play ball. And um, I came back home, and a friend of my mom said, well, if you're looking at a Christian college, why not Biola? Now, I didn't know what a Christian college was, had no framework for it at all. But when I found that I had to go to chapels and take Bible courses, it was what my heart was hungering for. It was what my heart was hungering for. Like, who is this God who literally I am afraid of? So um, fast forward, I, I, I end up going to Biola. I was, I was scared. I grew up in church. I, I grew up in a United Methodist church. I just saw on your screen there's a little United Methodist church um, uh, ad there. And um, I, I went to church every Sunday and did whatever I wanted to the rest of the week. And so it just felt incongruent. My life felt incongruent. It was just like, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this when... Um, uh, I'm either going to pursue God or I'm going to just live on my own, do my own thing. And so I get to, I get to Biola, and uh, it was a hard transition for me. It was hard, the, like the Christianese, if you will, the language spoken, it was really hard. And I, I went to public schools, right, and so I got there, and, and um, just everything's tight. Everyone's praying for you and, you know, sweet talking. I'm just like, what is, <laughs> like, what is happening here? And... Um, but I sat in a chapel one day, and a speaker came up and talked about God of love, of mercy, and grace. And I had not known or experienced God that way. And it just began to melt my heart. And I began to see God, by his Holy Spirit, began to open up my heart uh, to who he really is. The one thing I think, I hope, uh, and, and, and our prayer for you is that you would have right perspective of who God is. I, one of the, my takeaways from my undergrad experience, and it's still with me to, the, to this, literally to this day, is that I came into college believing that God was small and that my life, my world, my issues, my problems were big. God was small. My issues were big. God was, was small. My issues were big. And I left college. God is big. We serve a, a great God. He's bigger, he's better, he's stronger. And my issues, I mean, they're real, but they're, they're here in perspective. One of the things I love to do when I was in Southern California, cannot do this in Fresno, but I, I lived about 20 uh, minutes, about 30 minutes from the beach, right? So I, went to, I, I would go once, like once a week, what, excuse me, once a month or so, at least once a month, I would go down to Seal Beach. If any of you are from SoCal, near Huntington Beach, Seal Beach, all that stuff, you go further down to Newport Beach, et cetera. But I'd go to Seal Beach uh, at least once a month, and I would, I would just walk on the shores. I would not go into the water because I heard sharks like dark meat. And so I just stayed. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You're with me. Thank you. So, no, seriously, I would, I would just walk on the shores. And, and the, the, the ocean is one of the few places where all the five senses are activated, right? Sense of, uh, of, of touch, obviously smell, taste, the saltiness of the air, the, 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 the hearing, the the waves, but one of the things it did for me was give perspective, it perspectives, just how big God is, and again, how small we are. Not insignificant, please hear me, not insignificant, but how small we are. Just, again, how big God is, how, again, small, not insignificant, though. We are significant. We matter to him, and so perspective perspective. So um, that's a little bit of my, my background and my story. I want to share today. You know what? I forgot to put the timer on. Okay, let me, let me, how much time do I have? Just let me, sorry, I can't. Six minutes? Oh, 15. I was like, six minutes? Okay. Okay, let me, ju let me jump to, um, let me pull this up here. So if you, if you're able to jump on your, um, 
if you have a Bible with you or if you have a Bible app, um, you want to jump on that to Numbers 13, Genesis, Exodus, um, Leviticus, Numbers, the fourth book of the Bible. It's part of the, what they call the Pentateuch. It's the, the first five books that Moses wrote. And leading up to this chapter in the Bible, uh, the Israelites are, are what we would call the chosen people of God. And Moses is their leader. And Moses is um, actually, some of you know the story or you've seen the, the cartoon, the Disney version, Prince of Egypt. He, uh, he, he is, um, he's actually, he's an Israelite, um, but the Pharaoh had been uh, killing all the firstborns, but his mom hid him. And then he, uh, Moses was adopted actually by uh, the Egyptians. And so he was raised in Egyptian culture, schools, etc. And then, um, this is a short version of the story, he actually ends up getting angry and murders uh, an Egyptian. And then he flees. And he's in the desert wandering for a number of decades, actually. And God tells him, the Egyptians, or excuse me, the, the is, is Israelites are in slavery to the Egyptians. And so God tells him that come from, come from, uh, the desert, and, and we're going to, um, I'm going to release uh, our people. I'm going to re release my people. And so Moses goes back to Egypt, and he says to the Pharaoh, he says, hey, God has said, you got to let us go. And Pharaoh's just like, and this is, this is not, um, this is a loose translation here. <laughs> uh, Pharaoh's just like, no, man, you, you know, we got pyramids to build and all this stuff. <laughs> and so I can't let you go. And Moses is just like, no, you got to let us go. And Pharaoh's just like, oh, no, man, we got, we got work to do here. And uh, more, you know, straw and more bricks, all that stuff. And, and um, Moses is like, okay, have it your way. You know, like, is that Burger King? Have it your way? Have it your way. And so God just... Um, sends these plagues, these 10 plagues on the Egyptians, and they're horrible. I mean, it's just like you read this stuff in the Bible, and you're just like crazy, like water, the water of the Nile turning to blood, frogs, you know, devouring the land, locusts, um, gnats, and all kinds of their animals dying. And then he sends this one, the last one, um, he got basically, and, and after each one, the Pharaoh's heart is just hardened, actually. The Pharaoh just doubles down. And then finally, uh, God sends this one plague, and it's, it's where he kills all the firstborn of the Egyptian. And the Is Israelites had to put blood of a lamb over their doorposts, right? So they, their firstborn would be spared. And so the Jews today still celebrate Passover, right? They're passed over uh, this death. And so that finally happens, and, and the Israelites are free to go. And so as they start walking to the promised land, right, they start walking to the promised land, the Egyptians are like, oh, okay, wait a minute. We, actually, we're going to go after them. And so the Egyptians start chasing uh, the Jews as they're going to the promised land, and they hit the Red Sea. And so you can't cross a sea without a boat. Uh, but God does a miracle for them. God does a miracle for them. The sea act literally parts, and the Israelites walk through on dry land. And as the Egyptians are coming, the water just covers them up. And so they get to the other side. So they get to the other side, and um, <laughs> it's, it's kind of crazy. They get to the other side, and they start grumbling, like, how, what are we going to eat? What are we going to do? They actually wish they were back in bondage, in slavery. Uh, but God does more miracles. He provides water for them. He prov provides food. He provides, the Bible says he provided manna in the morning or bread in the morning and quail or meat at night. So they had bread in the morning, meat at night, manna in the morning, meat at night, and water. And so uh, they were satisfied. They didn't have to do anything. It literally is a miracle. It just this food appears for them. And so then they're, they're about to go into the promised land. Now it's interesting. The, the Bible says God was just giving them this land. But the Israelites said, hey, let's, let's go spy out the land. Let's go check out the land that God says is flowing with milk and honey, a land that's flowing with milk and honey. And if you're not lactose intolerant, I mean, it's just awesome. You're just like, yes. Um, so they send 10, or excuse me, they send 12 spies into the land, a, 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 a person from each tribe. 
they, get, they go into the land, they spend like 40 days in there and to check it out. And, and they see all this stuff. And um, let me grab my Bible out here because I'm going to... I actually travel with my, my big Bible on the plane. So that's for you guys. That's the, that's the love that I have for you guys. I brought the big guy. Um, and so they get here. And so let me just pick it up. You'll see, um, is that verse 28 on the screen? But right before that, so two, two things. I want to go back to Numbers 13, 1. And, it's, and, and this is the first verse in Numbers 13. It says, then the Lord spoke to Moses. Then the Lord spoke to Moses. So God speaks, God speaks, God speaks. Moses was a friend of God. He was intimately acquainted with God. God speaks. So whether you know him or not, whether you hear him or not, he is speaking. So God speaks to Moses. They send the spies out, and you go to um, uh, verse uh, 23 in that chapter, and he says, then they came to the valley of Eskel from and from there, this is the spies in the land. They cut down a single cluster of grapes, and they carried it on a pole between the two men with some pomegranates and figs. So the grapes were so heavy that two men had to hold it on a pole. Now, just incidentally on the way, Beth and I live in a home that's owned by Fresno Pacific. It was donated to them. And, and they have what they call a mini orchard in the back, right? So there's a, a lot of different fruit and things back there, including grapes pomegranates and figs so as I was preparing for this I'm just like oh now the grapes that we have I don't know what type of grapes they are but it, they're not they're not huge clusters they're like tiny grapes I don't know if they're wine grapes or uh, probably not wine here but grape juice grapes uh, we will use that and um, but just as I was reading this I'm just like oh gosh so here God is telling them to go in the land they spy it out so um Let's jump, let's jump to, um, to verse, I'm going to read just picking up at verse 25, and then you'll see on the screen the other verses. When they returned from spying out the land at the end of 40 days, they proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation, right, of the sons of Israel. And, I'm, uh, and, and, the, and this is what they said. They showed them the fruit of the land. And they told, they told him and said, we went into the land where you sent us, and it certainly does flow with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. And, and here's verse 28. And, and I have, this is a new living translation you see on the screen here. Uh, I'm going to read from the new American Standard Version. It says, nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong, and their cities are for fortified and very large. And moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. And so, so the 12 went in, and, and this is what they saw. They saw, and they all experienced the same thing. And um, they said, yeah, the, the, there's fruit. There's fruit there, and there are large people who, uh, who live there. And then I think next slide um, shows verse 30. But Caleb... Um, uh, Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, we should by, by all means go up and take possession of, possession of it, uh, for we shall surely overcome it or conquer it, right? But the other men who had explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them, for they are stronger than us. They are stronger than us. So they go out to the center. Let's see, next slide. Um, so they spread this bad report. They spread a bad report amongst the Israelites. The land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. And all the people we saw were used. So this is, this is not true, right? The first part, what they saw and experienced is true. Like there are big people there. There's a lot of fruit. And now they start, they start exaggerating, actually. They start actually misrepresenting what happened. They started in doing their own interpretation of it. They're just like, yeah, they're big. And guess what? They're going to devour us. Uh, we even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers. And that's what they thought of us, too. Right? This version says, and we became like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. So Caleb and Joshua, two of the spies, right? They did the recon. They come back and they say, hey, let's take the land. But 10 say, no way, we're going to get devoured. 
we're like grasshoppers. We're like grasshoppers to them. So I, I just want you to say, well, actually turn to your neighbor and say, I am not a grasshopper. I am not a grasshopper. And so a couple things, a couple things I want to, I want to tell you, just, uh, there's lots of lessons in this, uh, lots of lessons in this passage. I mean, a lot of lessons here, but I want to highlight a couple for you. One, one is remember, you have to remember who God is. Remember, God had delivered them from slavery. He had parted the Red Sea. He'd given them food, you know, manna in the morning, meat at night, given them water. He'd done all these things for them. They didn't have to do anything except walk, actually obey. And they forgot. They did not remember who God is. And there's a way of remembering. My old boss at Biola would say there's a way of remembering. It's like nostalgic. Like you go back and you want to go back to the way things were. This is not the kind of remembering that is. And there's a way of, of, of actually forgetting the past. It's just like it's so bad or we, don't, we, we just want to forget it. But there's a way of honoring the past and, and certainly remembering what God has done in your life, whether you know it or not. Like for me, again, when years pass and I can look back and see where God was in my life growing up and in my family and doing things. And so remember, what are those things that you need to remember? What are those things that you need to rem remember that God has done for you? Maybe being here at Tabor is a miracle. You know it's tight financially. But God has somehow made a way for you to be here. Maybe it's something with your family. Like you, you had something going on in your family and God delivered you. You need to remember that. You remember, need to remember who God is. Remember, I, I've never been a part of a 12-step of, of a program, but they tell me that, that those who go in, the first step is admitting that you have a problem, and the ste second step is acknowledging that there's a power higher than you to help you with that problem. So that power higher we call God, what has he done for you? You need to remember what he has done for you. The other thing here is, is again, 10 of them came in, bless you, 10 of them came in and said, and said this is a bad report. And so, and then, and that, that unfaithfulness spread throughout the camp. And what happens, the longer version of the story, you got to check it out in Numbers 14 and beyond, is that that whole generation of Israelites died off. They did not go into the promised land. God, God said, you, you guys are faithless. And Moses prayed, and, and basically Caleb and Joshua ends up leading them in after that generation dies off. But who are you listening to? Who are you listening to? Are you listening to the Caleb's and the Joshua's and the Esther's and the Naomi's? Are you listening to the 10 who are just negative? They're scared, right? They're overwhelmed. They're scared. And fear is a powerful force, friends. Fear is a powerful force. And it renders us, it's almost like uh, anemic, like it just it crippled them. They did not trust because they were so fearful. But I'm going to tell you, love is a more powerful force. And God loved them, and he loves you, and he loves us. And this is not just a message about pursuing your dreams. I, I just want to make that clear. It's not a message just about pursuing your, your dreams, but it is a message about what does God have for us. I believe that he's created us for purpose and for meaning. I, I believe that he's created us to do good works for him. And I believe that, again, fear, we have to acknowledge it. We can't dismiss it. Right? So Caleb and Joshua, they saw the same things, and they didn't dismiss that they were giants in the land. They didn't dismiss that there were, um, uh, you know, these, these, these men that they saw could, could potentially take them. But they trusted God. They had heard God, and they'd seen, they remembered what God had done, and they walked in faith. They believed in faith that God would give them the land. God actually never said go in and fight and, and um, conquer and battle for the land. He just said, uh, go in and take the land to pos possess it. God was just giving it to them. And I'm seeing my time is getting, getting short. So let me, um, let me just end with two things here uh, for you. It's going to take courage to step forward. And there's all types of courage, right? Interpersonal cu courage, physical courage, we know, social courage, emo emotional courage, spiritual courage to make these steps into what God is calling you. But again, I started off saying, I, I believe God 
Um, when I went to college, I believed God was small, and my world and my issues and my problems were big. And we point back to Numbers 13, right? At the end of that chapter, the last verse says, we were like grasshoppers. We were like grasshoppers. And you're not a grasshopper. You're created as in, in his image. One commentator said this. He said the ten spies who were faithless, who were scared, they looked at the giants in the land. They looked at the giants in the land, and they compared themselves to the giant. And they said, we can't do this. We can't do this. But the two, Joshua and Caleb, looked at the giants, and they compared the giants to God. They compared the giants to God, and they said, let's roll. We can do this. We've got a God who's bigger, who's better, who's stronger. And so my encouragement to you today is that you have a God who's bigger, better, and stronger. What are the giants you're facing? I don't know. Are those giants from your own family like me? I had to confront my dad at one point. That was scary for me. So is it family members? Is, it, is, is your giant the expectation of others that you have to confront? Is your giant uh, some addiction that you have to acknowledge and face and get help? have the courage to step forward in that. I don't know what your, your giant is, but I can tell you this. Our God is bigger, better, stronger. And this is what he says for those of us who believe. I think the last um, slide I have up there is, um, I think it's the one on uh, Luke 12. Is there a, a slide? Yeah, there, there it is. So if you fast forward to, fast forward to the New Testament, and this is Jesus speaking now to and, and it's so interesting throughout the Bible, this concept of don't fear, don't be discouraged. And Jesus says to his people, he says, fear not. Don't be afraid, little children, little flock. Don't be afraid, for it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, to give you the promise. Like, wow, here it is, Jesus, thousands of years later, saying it's his good pleasure to give it to you. You don't have to fight. You don't have to battle. You don't have to conquer. You just receive it. You just receive it. So let me pray, pray for you as I close. Lord Jesus, thank you for uh, this time. Thank you for the Tabor community and their, um, wow, their love for you, for you. And I pray that as you are with these students, their faculty and staff, may they know that they serve a, a big God who's bigger, better, stronger than any giant that they can face, God. And I pray that they leave this place knowing that they're loved, that you're with them, your gracious presence is with them, and that they would t talk to someone who can help them if, they're, if they need help discerning, God, who you are and, and, and what you desire for them, that they would have the courage to take that next faithful step. I bless them today. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.